Hi there, welcome back to the Veterinary Technician Online Review course. And we're still uh, working our way through 2.2 in Anatomy and Physiology. And this lecture will specifically be uh, talking about the skeletal system. So bone itself is the framework that supports and protects, uh, protects the soft tissues of the body. But it also has, not only does it make our structure, but it also serves other functions. For example, leverage for skeletal muscles and tendons for storage, for example, like minerals like calcium is st stored within the bone. Uh, blood cell formation. We've talked about hematopoiesis, which is um, the form how it's basically the manufacturing of blood and this happens within the bone marrow. Um, bone happens to be the second hardest substance in the body, the first being the enamel on your teeth. And bone is composed of cells embedded in a matrix. We've talked about this in past PowerPoints. Matrix being, uh, remember we talked about jello and the fruit, the fruit being the cells and the jello being the matrix. So it's what the cells are suspended in. And the matrix is made up of collagen fibers um, embedded in protein and polysaccharides. The bone structure, there's two different types of bones that we can be talking about. It can uh, be cancellous bone or spongy bone, and it has um, a light, it's light and spongy, has tiny spicules or holes where bone marrow is found, and you can see those little tiny spicules in the picture right here. And it's found, um, the cancellous spongy bone is found in the center of long bones. So remember our long bones um, would be things like our humerus and our femur, for example, and this is what you would find in the center of those bones. The other type of bone is compact bone. So these are dense and heavy as opposed to the spongy bone. Um, makes up the shaft of long bones. So not the center, but the shaft and the outside layer of all bones. Um, composed of tiny cylinder bones um, called Haversian system. We talked about the Haversian system already. It can, it, and these Haver, this Haversian system contains blood, lymph vessels, and nerves. And osteocytes are located within these layers. And osteocytes are, osteo means bone, site means cell. So the Haversian system consists of multiple layers called la uh, lamella, lamellae um, of compact bone tissue that surrounds a central canal. The Haversian canal contains the bone nerves and blood supply, which is what we talked about before, and it runs parallel with the bone. Um, there are perpendicular canals that, con that connect each Haversian canal, and those are called Volksmann canal. This should be review. We've already talked about this. Osteocytes live within their own small space in the compact bone and the Haversian canals, and they're called lacuna. Um, and then very tiny canals run within the compact bone and Haversian canals called caniculi. Okay, and osteocytes exchange nutrients and wastes through these caniculi channels. This here will show you what we were just talking about. So you can see this is one chunk of bone here. We have our cancellous bone. So we know that this is going into the center of the bone. So this is the spongy bone. And then the compact bone is everything out here. And if you can take it, you can see that there's this circular tube here. And that's called a Haversian system, okay? And within the Haversian system, there's the Haversian canal, okay? And this is where the blood and nerve uh, vessels are going in and out of and um, in between these Haversian canals connecting one to another are the Volksmann canals you can see that so it runs um, per uh, perpendicular to the bone and um, all these little dark circles that we're seeing in here these are the caniculi this is where the osteocytes reside so that's where osteocytes are bone cells so the formation of bone happens there So continuing on with the compact bone structure, um, we have our spongy bone in the center of our long bones and then our compact bones. You can see the caniculi, those dots there, and that's where the osteocytes lie. Um, and the uh, this is a close-up view uh, within there. And you can see the lacuna, the osteocytes are in there, osteoclasts osteoblasts, caniculi, all of that in there. So again, it's just demonstrating the uh, internal anatomy of that compact bone. This is a micrograph of a section of compact bone. 
um, it's very interesting. You can see the Haversian system. The dark circle is the Haversian canal. Okay, so that's where the blood vessel and nerves go through, which is surrounded by rings. Uh, concentric lamellae, I don't know how to pronounce that, I should have figured that out, um, of calcified bone matrix. The lamellae contains dark spots, and um, these are the lacunae holes where the osteocytes are found. So very interesting. Bone structure. The outer bone is covered by a membrane called a periosteum. Um, except for articular surfaces, like in joints, okay? So articular surfaces just mean surfaces where there's going to be movement. But besides those areas, the bones are always covered by a thin membrane called a periosteum. The outer layer of the periosteum is made up of fibrous tissue, and the inside is made up, made up of osteoblasts. So this enables the bone to grow in diameter and helps heal bone fractures. So this periosteum that wraps itself around the bone, um, the outside is a fibrous tissue, but the inside is made of osteoblasts. And that's how bone formation happens is thanks to these osteoblasts. So if a bone has to grow larger in diameter, for example, if we're thinking of a grown puppy, um, these growing puppies, the, the diameter of their bones will get larger thanks to these osteoblasts on the inside of the periosteum that's wrapped around that bone. And um, the inner hollow part of a bone is lined by a membrane called the endosteum, okay, and this contains osteoblasts as well that will help with bone formation. So <clears throat> three different types of bone cells that we're going to be talking about. Um, osteoblasts, we've already mentioned that these. And these are the cells that make bone. They produce bone. They secrete the matrix of bone and then supplies minerals to harden it. And that whole process of hardening that bone is called ossification. There's osteocytes. Once surrounded by the ossified matrix, which is the bone, osteoblasts are called osteocytes. <coughs> Excuse me. So these cells can actually revert back to osteoblasts if an injury happens, and then it can continue on with ossification, and that's how a fracture actually ends up healing. And um, osteoclast is kind of like the evil twin of osteoblasts, and they actually eat away at bone, but this is necessary. Bones must be remodeled constantly, and osteoclasts remove bone from where it is not needed. So these cells allow the body to withdraw calcium from bones when an animal is hypocalcemic. So if there's a, um, a patient that's hypocalcemic um, or low calcium in the blood, the body's automatically going to start taking it from the bones. And it's the osteoclasts that actually do that. And um, so that's why in you know, older patients, we need to make sure, well, in any patient, we have to make sure that the calcium level in the diets are appropriate so that they don't become hypocalcemic because then their bones are going to get pretty frail because of these osteoclasts that are going to start removing calcium from the bone and, and giving it to, to our blood. So that's what the osteoclasts do. So as far as the blood supply to our bones, most blood vessels travel through the Haversian canals and the Volksmann canals, which we've already showed you, and it brings nutrition to the osteocytes. Remember, the osteocytes are the ones that are going to make bone. There is something called a nutrient foramina in that bone, and it's another entrance for large blood and lymph vessels and nerves, primarily found in long bones and carry blood in and out of the bone marrow. And it's important to know that an um, that a nutrient, sorry, important to know that a nutrient foramen may resemble a fracture on an X-ray. So when a doctor is viewing an X-ray, they have to be aware that this nutrient foramina um, can resemble a fracture, which I think you'll see on the next slide. Yeah, so this is a, an x-ray of a long bone, and you may look at what that arrow is pointing at, that line there, and go, hmm, that looks like a fracture. But um, that may seem that way to the uneducated eye, but we know that nutrient foraminas um, or nutrient foramins look just like that. And that's exactly what we're looking at here on this x-ray. So how does born, uh, bone come about, okay? So how is it made? And there's two different mechanisms, okay? There's endochondral bone formation. So it grows into 
and replaces cartilage. Chondro is the, the root word meaning um, cartilage, so endochondral bone formation. And there's also intramembranous bone formation. So this develops from fibrous tissue membrane. So there's two different ways, and we're going to talk about both of those. Endochondral bone formation, most of the bones develop this way, okay? So the bone, or what's going to be bone, just starts out as cartilage, and that's within the fetus. So when a dog is pregnant, um, we talked about how you're not going to be, um, we talked in class about how when taking an x-ray of a pregnant mother, you're not going to be able to see the bones um, until the third trimester because the bone formation doesn't happen until then and before then they're actually just made up of cartilage and then we and then throughout the development of the fetus that cartilage will ossify into bone but that doesn't happen until late in the fetus's um, growth stage so um, the, bo the bone begins replacing the cartilage at the shaft so um, the bone the middle part of the bone is called the diaphysis, the shaft part of the bone, and that's where bone actually starts replacing cartilage. So this is called the primary growth, growth center. And then there's also a secondary growth center, which is the epiphysis. So the shaft, the middle part of the bone is the diaphysis, and then the, each tip of that long bone is the epiphysis. And that's the secondary growth center. Cartilage is removed gradually as bone is created. So by the time an animal is bo born, most of the cartilage has been replaced by bone. Um, two areas remain as cartilage plates. And, and we're just two areas, and we're talking about within that one long bone. So it's located between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So the diaphysis being the middle of the bone, the epiphysis being the tip of the bone. There's a small area there where it actually stays cartilage. And this allows a little puppy femur to become a big grown dog femur okay so there needs to even though the bone is completely ossified and formed there still needs to be growth within that long bone and thanks to these um, these growth plates or epiphyseal plates that are located between the diaphysis and the epiphysis we can that can happen so it allows long bones to lengthen as the animal grows so within each plate cartilage cells make new cartilage on the outside so the epiphyseal surface of the plate and then the osteoblasts replace the cartilage with bone on the inside the diaphyseal surface and that's how bones grow longer when a bone has reached its full size, the epiphyseal plate completely off ossifies and turns to bone. So as an adult, um, like myself right now, I do not have any of these epiphyseal plates or growth plates because once I've reached my, my fullest height and the fullest length of my femur or whatever long bone I'm talking about, those ep epiphyseal plates, which are made up of cartilage, will ossify. And that's how they stop growing. So this right here will show you a long bone. Um, the middle part here you can see is the diaphysis, so it's the shaft, and then the epiphyseal, uh, the epiphysis, which is um, uh, at each end here. Um, the blue shows you the articular surfaces. Okay, so this is uh, cartilage here, and that's going to articulate. So um, this is a femur bone. So we're looking at the head of the femur here, and that's going to go into your acetabulum. So that's the articular surface. You can see the cancellous bone that lies. Right in the middle so there's bone marrow in there and um, these are the epiphyseal plates that I was talking about so it's right between the diaphysis and the epiphysis it's right here and there's one down here as well and that's gonna stay cartilage until that animal has grown up to its fullest potential and then after that those epiphyseal plates will then ossify and then the bone will not grow any longer this is an x-ray here showing the epiphyseal plate. So again, this may be something that may end up looking like a fracture to the uneducated eye. Um, it may look like there's a fracture right here on this bone, but it's actually the growth plate. It's the epiphyseal plate that we're seeing here on the x-ray. And if you do look at an x-ray of, um, of a young puppy or kitten, you may be able to visualize this epiphys epiphyseal plate. So that's endochondral bone formation. Now, intramembranous bone formation only happens in certain skull bones. So it's very specific to the skull itself. The bone forms in fibrous tissue membranes that cover the brain in the fetus, and it creates the flat bones of the cranium. 
So there's different types of bone shapes, and there's four basic ones that we're going to talk about. And I've listed the pages in your anatomy and physiology book that you can view these um, shapes of bone. There's long bones, for example, your femur and your humerus. Um, there's short bones, which are actually end up being cube-like, kind of like your um, metacarpals. And then there's irregular bones. Oh, sorry, I skipped flat. There's flat bones as well, kind of like your scapula and your pelvis. And then there's irregular bones, which is kind of like a miscellaneous category. So they're, they don't fit into any of the other three. Uh, for example, your vertebrae. They're not cube long or flat they kind of take on their own shape and that's where they fall into is the irregular and you can see here a showing you the long bone b showing you um, the cube shaped bone c the flat bone and then d is a vertebrae which is um, a part of the irregular shaped category the bone marrow, so we, we already kind of mentioned the bone marrow and they, they fill the spaces within the bones um, and they're found in long bones solely, okay? So in, in all the other bones, you're not going to find bone marrow, it's within the long bones. And there's two different types of bone marrow. There's the red bone marrow, and this is a very important type of bone marrow because this is hematopoietic tissue. This is where hematopoiesis happens, is within the red bone marrow. It's the most common type in young animals. So when an animal is first born, the majority of their bone marrow is going to be red bone marrow, and that's where hematopoiesis happens. There's a lot of growth happening, and there's a lot of blood production that needs to happen. And thanks to this bone marrow, red bone marrow, it can. Now, as you get older, a lot of this red bone marrow will turn into yellow bone marrow. And it's actually adipose connective tissue, um, adipose being like a fatty connective tissue. And it's the most common in adults. But don't be fooled. If ever something happens to an adult where there is a large demand for um, hematopoiesis, this yellow bone marrow can actually revert back to red bone marrow and that will help increase um, the blood supply. So for example, if a patient becomes anemic and then their body recognizes that there, there's a huge need for blood, their yellow bone marrow will actually magically revert back to the red bone marrow and actually start hematopoiesis to, to help out with that anemia. Now bone features. So there's different things to talk about here. There's articular surfaces. We know that articular means movement. So um, typically we're referring to joint surfaces here. There's processes. That just means any kind of protrusion that comes off of a bone, any lumps, bumps, or other protrusions off of a bone. It can be part of a joint or an area where a tendon actually attaches muscle to bone. So these are called processes. And then there's holes and depressed areas within a bone as well. Foramen. When we're talking about the foramen of a bone, it's a hole. And uh, nerves and blood vessels usually pass through one of these. Um, and then there's the fossa, which is a depression or a depressed or sunken in area of the bone. And it's usually occupied by muscles or tendons. <clears throat> so the skeletal system is um, basically separated into two different parts. There's the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton is the bones of the head and the trunk. And if you take a look on that page 111 there, you can see that. And then the appendicular skeleton is, um, just think of the appendicular as like appendages, okay? So it's all the appendages. So the front legs and the back legs, and um, including the scapula, scapula and the pelvis. Um, and that makes up the appendicular skeleton. This here shows you the axial skeleton. So you can see it's the main, it's the head and the main core of the body. So all the way down the vertebrae, the ribs are included in this as well as the sternum. But you can see that the scapula and the pelvis are removed. This is where the scapula would go and this is where the pelvis would go. They're removed because those are a part of the appendicular skeleton. They're a part of the appendages. So the axial skeleton, if we start talking about the skull, it consists of 37 different bones and they're all attached to each other by joints and those joints are called sutures. Um, the hyoid bone is a part of the axial skeleton. It looks like an H and it's located high at the neck and it helps you swallow. There's the spinal column which extends from the skull to the tip of the tail, and it's divided into five different regions. So there's the cervical vertebrae, 
So the cervical spinal column, cervical vertebrae, and there's seven of those vertebrae. There's the thoracic vertebrae, and there's 13 of those. There's the lumbar vertebrae, which there's seven. And now there is a variation in species when we talk about each one of these vertebrae, but I'm just going to stick with cat and dog vertebrae. And then the sacral, which is uh, made up of three vertebrae and um, coccygeal, which it, it can absolutely vary depending on the length of the tail. Um, ribs form the lateral wall of the thorax. It helps move air in and out of the lungs, and then the ribs will attach ventrally to the sternum. Uh, this is also called the breastbone, and it's made up of several sternobrae, kind of like the, the spinal column is made up of vertebrae. The sternum is made up of sternobrae bones, and the first sternobrae is the manubrium, and the last one is the xiphoid. So only those two sternobrae are actually named. So the very bottom one, uh, closer to the abdominal cavity, is called the xiphoid. And then the very first one is called um, the manubrium. This here is showing you the appendicular skeleton. We saw that the axial skeleton was just the skull and the core. This right here is showing you the appendages. So the in the front, you have the scapula all the way down to the tip of the toe. And then in the back, you have the pelvis all the way down to the tip of the toe. And this is what makes up the appendicular skeleton. So let's start with the thoracic limb for the appendicular skeleton. We start up by the scapula, which happens to be a flat bone. We move on down to the humerus, which is connected to that scapula. The humerus is a long bone of the upper arm, also called the brachium. Um, and then after that, past the elbow, we have the radius and the ulna. Now the radius is the main weight-bearing bone of the forearm, also called the antibrachium. And the ulna, which is the smaller of those two bones, is the major portion of, it makes up the major portion of the elbow, but it is the smaller of the two bones, okay? So um, right below the elbow, you'll find the radius and the ulna, and they're kind of side by side, radius being the bigger one, and it's the, the weight-bearing bone, and then the ulna, which is the smaller of the bone, and it makes up the major portion of your elbow. After that, you go down to um, the carpal bones, which are two rows of carpal bones, and and um, it, they, both of those make up the carpus, which is the wrist, okay? Um, I think a few PowerPoints back, we were talking about those small cube-shaped bones, and I may have said a metacarpal, but I meant to say carpal. Carpal, those are the cube-shaped bones that we'll have in, the, in that category. And then we have metacarpals, which extends from the wrist all the way to the knuckles, okay? So if you move your fingers back and forth, you can see your metacarpals underneath your skin moving, and those are the fairly long longer bones that connect all the way up to your knuckles. And then you have phalanges, which are fingers, and that's where it ends for the thoracic limb. For the pelvic limb, we start up at the pelvis. Obviously, the pelvis itself is made up of three bones, and um, the, those three bones are on each side of the pelvis, so the pelvis is separated um, in half to a right side and a left side. So each side has an ilium, an ischium, and a pubis, and then the halves come together at the pubic symphysis, which is um, a cartilage there that allows for stretching, for example, during birth. So the pelvis itself um, is connected to a femur, which is the long bone of the thigh. And then after the femur, before you get to the tibia and the fibula, you're, you're going to have your um, you're going to have your knee, which is called a stifle. Sorry, I just went blank there. A stifle. And um, below the stifle, you're going to have two bones, which is the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is the main weight-bearing bone of the hind leg. The cranial aspect forms the stifle. And then after that, you're going to have the fibula, which is the smallest of the two hind leg bones. So kind of like the front leg, we had the humerus. And then after the elbow, we had the radius and the ulna that were side by side. The hind leg is very similar where after the femur and after the knee, the stifle, you're going to have the tibia and the fibula that are going to also be side by side. The tibia being the main weight bearing bone and the larger of the two. After that, your ankle is going to be um, the tarsal bone or the tarsus. And these are two rows of tarsal bones, which makes up the tarsus. In quadrupeds, it's called a hawk. Okay, so you wouldn't call it an ankle.
excuse me, um, the metatarsal bones are, is the equivalent of the metacarpals. We said those extend from your wrist. The metacarpals extend from your wrist to your knuckles. It's the same on your feet, except for they extend from the hawk down to um, the tips of your phalanges, which are the toes. And that's where the pelvic limb ends. So in regards to joints uh, and our skeletal system, joints are the junctions between two bones. Okay, so some move and some don't. So there's three different classifications of joints. There's fibrous joints. These fibrous joints are immovable. And um, the, animal, the anatomical term is synarthrosis. For example, remember we talked about the cranium being, or the skull being made up of all these different types of bones, and they're all connected to each other by sutures, and that's where those bones connect and touch each other? Well, those are fibrous joints. They're, they don't move. You can't move your skull around because they're immovable. Synarthrosis, okay? So they're immovable joints. The second category is cartilaginous joints. So these are slightly movable. The anatomical term for this is amphiarthrosis. And this is an example of this is your pubic symphysis. So your right and left part of your pelvis is connected to each other in the middle at the pubic symphysis. And this is um, uh, movable cartilage. So during childbirth, those right and left parts of your pelvis can actually widen uh, thanks to the pubic symphysis. And that is a joint, uh, an amphiarthrosis joint so it is slightly movable but again I can't I can't grab onto a dog's hips that's just in for an exam and wiggle them back and forth because that joint is only slightly movable nothing like a synovial joint <clears throat> which is our next category and the synovial joint is very freely movable the, an the anatomical term for this is diarthrosis and it's for example your stifle um, it's enclosed by a joint capsule it contains joint fluid which is called synovial fluid, um, and it's lined by a synovial membrane, okay? Hence the synovial joint is lined by a synovial membrane that produces synovial fluid, okay? This all just mean, this is all found within the freely movable diarthrosis joints, okay? For example, elbow, knees, those are all synovial joints.